Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kissin. And this is a show for you if you're bored with people arguing on the internet over subjects they know nothing about. At Trigonometry, we don't pretend to be the experts, we ask the experts. Our brilliant guest this week is a wonderful comedian, one of our absolute favorites, Simon Evans. Welcome Thank you very much. Thank you. Very nice to be here. Very excited to be in these hallowed, <laughs> <laughs> this hallowed cube. Simon Evans destroys trigonometry. That will be the clip that comes out of this. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show. We've got so much to talk about, but for anyone who doesn't know who you are, yep. just tell us who are you, how are you, where you are, what's been your journey through life? I am uh, 54 years old now, um, uh, living in Hove in the south uh, coast, on the south coast next to Brighton with uh, my wife and two kids. Um, I've been a comedian for 22, 23 years now, um, which I sort of got into by accident, really. I was planning on a career in journalism. Um, having entered my 30s really without anything, really having any gears, having really bit into my life. And, um, and a newspaper asked me to write an article about people who were doing comedy workshops for fun, just for recreational purposes. And that began the sort of train of events which saw me begin stand up. And somehow it just clicked. So at about the age of 31, I started doing stand up. And um, incredibly, somehow, you know, every time one beam has given way, another one has appeared and I've leapt onto it in time and uh, I'm still making a living, touch wood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good. Uh, so there's so much going on with comedy right mm. now. Uh, you, you, you were performing a Comedy Unleashed. By the time this video goes out, it will already have happened. Yes. It's a show that we've talked about. Mm. We've both performed there. There's been a, an article recently that came out about that. There's lots of discussion about free speech. One of the biggest stories I think that's happened recently has been mm. the Joe Brand case. Mm. And for anyone who doesn't know, Joe Brand made the joke about how uh, instead of milk shaking, uh, I, I don't think she said far right, but con politicians that she didn't yes. agree with, yeah. uh, what we should do instead is uh, throw a battery at it. Yes. And then she was saying this as part of a comedy performance on yes. a comedy program. Yes. But I think a lot of the stuff that came out of that and I talked about it was the double standards of left versus right, freedom of speech for comedians, freedom of speech in general, the ability to make jokes. Mm. What was your take on that situation? Well, there were a number of salient factors. I think the most obvious one to say is that, uh, yes, of course, it was a joke. But I think it was a joke which, on a moment's reflection, you would see was probably not an appropriate thing to broadcast on Radio 4 at a point where tensions were very high. And I think the, pe the half the reason that milkshaking is such a, an effective tool is because it arouses a brief moment of panic in the victim when they don't know what's been thrown at them. You know, And I think people live in, in genuine fear of being attacked by something more serious. So I think a moment's reflection would have made anyone realize that it wasn't an appropriate thing to, to broadcast. And that moment should have then been grasped by the various you know, rafts of authority and editing processes and the producers and so on who would have mediated between Joe saying it and the audience laughing, but a little nervously, I think, and, and a sort of 24 hour gap at least before it was broadcast. So I certainly don't blame Joe Brand at all for um, a, a misjudgment or an error of, uh, of taste or whatever, because as I think we've all discussed before now, if you're to be able to function as a comedian, you'll have to be able to cross the line, realize you've crossed it and retreat without having your career in tatters, you know, without having a police investigation. People refer to edgy comedians, perhaps without really considering what the word means. Well, for me, it means the edge of what is acceptable and you transgress it occasionally and you play with it. Even if you just do a live gig in front of a, a, a comedy club audience, every comedian is always pushing up to see where their, where their collective edge is. And one or two people will feel you've crossed it at any given point and then you come back. And for some people, you know, making a joke at the expense of, let's say, Down syndrome will be something that's beyond the pale and they just won't accept it. And Frankie Boyle got into trouble with, with, with a joke like that a few years ago, having done other material in which he quite literally, you know, decapitates politicians and vomits <laughs> into their writhing mm. trunks, you know. So you just go, what, what is, you know, what, what is or is not acceptable in these situations? Mm. So it's not necessarily, I don't think it, it should be imposed on Joe Brand. But having said all that, there was a tiny bit of schadenfreude that I enjoyed in, in seeing her held up to account because she herself has called other people on that kind of stuff. You know, she, uh, she famously had Carol Thatcher essentially, you know, blackballed from any further employment prospects at the BBC after an off-the-cuff remark she made, you know, in the green room, uh, 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 I think, uh, a slightly old fashioned and misjudged joke that she made, but it wasn't, I don't think it was fueled by hate or any sort of vicious racism or anything. Well, Joe Brand reported that. Carol Thatcher never worked again, whether or whether that was not 
uh, intended as revenge for Joe Brand's quite open loathing for her mother, for, for, for Margaret Thatcher. I don't know, but it, it seemed to be an extraordinary coincidence if it wasn't. <laughs> and, um, and then she quite recently scolded Ian Hislop, of course, live on, on Have I Got News For You, when Hislop was um, essentially chortling at the notion that a bit of a sort of uh, a clumsy knee grope in the Commons canteen was on the same level of Me Too... Uh, horror story, you know, as, as the Weinstein revelations and so on. It was all being collected in, under the hashtag Me Too. I think a journalist, I can't remember if it was a journalist, you know, attempted to grope an MP or vice versa. Yeah, it was Julia Hartley yeah. Brewer. Yeah. Yeah. Right, okay, yeah. yeah. So, and it wasn't, you know, it, was, it wasn't like, he wasn't saying it doesn't matter, but he was kind of joking. It's not really quite on the same level as these Hollywood revelations. And Joe delivered this kind of minute long monologue telling him that this kind of thing just wears you down and got a round of applause. But essentially, she was policing his sense of humor and his sense of proportion and telling him, no, this matters. Well, that's all that everyone else has done. A lot of other people have then policed Joe and gone, no, sorry. But when you are a public figure, you do live in fear now of a serious assault on the street. And this kind of thing doesn't help. And if it had been the left who had been given an opportunity to castigate a right-wing comedian for joking about something, they would immediately have uh, you know, brought up Joe Cox murder and so on as, as indications of exactly why these kind of things are not to be joked about. So I think there has been a huge amount of hypocrisy. But none of it, I would say, in all seriousness, should hinder any comedian from cracking any joke they want to make, in a, in a, it's certainly in like a, a, a non-live scenario, because it's then expected that the producers will clean that up and go, actually, that on reflection doesn't really work for us. And so we're just going to slip it out, which, of course, they did in the later edition, <laughs> <laughs> demonstrating the lack of confidence that they had. Yeah. You know, I think so. the phrase is bolting the door. Yes, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. But maybe it was a discussion that needed to happen. I don't know. Mm. I don't know. But I don't blame Nigel Farage for kicking off because that's his opportunity, of course, to play the game. And that is the game we all play now. I do blame certain other comedians, funnily enough, who then claimed that this was hypocritical of Farage because Farage had defended Carl Benjamin over mm. his rape joke concerning Jess Phillips because he hadn't. Mm. Carl Benjamin was with UKIP, who, who, who Farage had left. Mm. And regardless of whether you like Farage or not, he left UKIP and has said it has become a den of, you know, weirdos and, you know, quite extremist figures. And, and, and indeed, it, it has sort of become a little bit of an odd... It's like a clearinghouse for uh, disaffected, you know, uh, internet warriors. Well, we've had Carl on the show long yeah. before all this controversy yeah. happened. Sargon of Akkad. Sargon of Akkad. <laughs> Which everyone, of course, who isn't in the internet just finds this absurd and like, well, that was his name from when he was a gaming journalist, yeah. wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. You know, I think he was part of Gamergate. I have no interest in that. Although Gamergate, some say, is actually the birth of everything that's happened since, certainly in America. You know, the whole of like... Uh, 4chan and poll and uh, and the green frog and and all of the sort of tongue in cheek support of of Trump and everything mm. and and whether or not and it, that shades into the the actual sort of a, a coherent politics of the alt right mm. you know it's a lot of it lodged in that in that sort of mm. culture war there so yeah it did. it's all these things are all linked up but Sargon mm. and I used to listen to some of his podcasts and, and YouTube content I always found him an annoying pompous sort of he had a certain kind of presumption on his part that he was the smartest guy in the room, you know, and I always thought you should maybe look at getting into some better rooms, if that's, <laughs> you know what I mean, if that's how you feel, you yeah. know, raise your game a little bit. It's easy to just talk at that kind of weird, you know, uh, black death metal, uh, black cross kind of guys, you know, and think you're a bit smarter than them and understand how nationalism really works or something, you know, if that's the kind of company you're keeping, like, elevate your status a bit. And unfortunately, I think, he came a cropper because, you know, the mainstream media will just kind of go, you're a lunatic, you're a risible figure, and here is your one claim to fame. It was a misjudged rape joke about mm. a sitting MP. You, and so you're, you know, you're no longer fit for purpose. Well, since you brought that up, Simon, sorry. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, yeah, the Sargon <laughs> of a CAD fans who are here, I can already see the, well, yeah. the oh, comments well, on yeah. the YouTube video. You get some, do you? You've, you've got some overlap with him. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, well, he's been on the show, so a lot yeah, of yeah. people who watch us also... Well, I, I don't dislike him. I just... My visceral reaction to no, him was, not, was yeah. not very positive. But I don't think it was fair of the mainstream media to say you are the guy who cracked that one joke and that is your entire... Well, this is what I was going to ask you about. Yeah. And by the way, uh, Carl comes to Comedy Unleashed quite a lot. Okay. So when you're performing, he'll be <laughs> he'll heckling be going, you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he'll be throwing pints at you. But um, uh, I, one of the... I talked about this Joe Brand thing on the BBC and stuff. And one of the things that people were saying was, 
Well, look at Carl Benjamin, right? Yeah. He made a joke. Yeah. Uh, and everyone jumped down his throat. Yeah. And I guess for me, the difficulty is that it's not so much that he made the joke. And I've said this to Carl face to face. I said, I thought that was the wrong thing to say because he said it to her yeah. on Twitter. Yeah. As opposed to just making a joke yeah. somewhere else. It, yeah. it was much more personal. Is that the line that you think about it's there? It's very or? interesting. I mean, it's obviously is a different context and mm. context matters. Mm. But whether it makes it better or worse is a really interesting question, isn't it? I, I mean, would if if as a as a comedian I were to go on heresy and say you know uh, women MPs are always trying to introduce legislation about rape. To be honest, I look at some of them. I wouldn't even rape them. Mm. Well, I think that would be the end of my career. I mean, mm. that would be an absolute you know in that context. Mm. And I wouldn't make that joke, and I don't think it would be funny. <laughs> but I want to be clear. You've about only that, just but, made it on the yeah, internet. Yeah. But now that, that'll get quoted. You know? yeah. But if, if, if you were to make that joke in that context, that would be a, you know that would yeah, be yeah that know, would yeah, be yeah, career and, and they wouldn't broadcast mm. it either. Yeah. And, and then word would get out, probably yeah. via Joe Brand. But, yeah. um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You're but, only going for her on this one, yeah. But, so in that respect, you have to say, well, then, the, you know, the context is presumably less so. But on the other hand, he used, I, I felt, I sort of was following the debate at the time, and if I remember correctly, she was, he felt that she was um, sort of minimising and trivialising and, and, and laughing off the notion that, men's sexual health, men th th threats that men face and so on need the same sort of level of protection as women or whatever. Mm. And in that context, he obviously felt that the, the heat was already raised and that this was the, the, the heat, at the level at which a response like that was appropriate, whereas obviously just kind of out of the blue and out of nowhere, it wouldn't be. Context is kind of everything in these things. And of course, it's the first casualty of war. You know, mm. So that's the, that is the tricky aspect of it. Mm. But I didn't think it was, I don't think it was a great joke, but then I didn't think Joe Brands was a great joke either. The reality is, it's not heresy to say that. That was the one thing everyone mm. said that annoyed me, goes, well, you tune into a program like heresy, what do you expect? Well, no, that isn't heresy. In front of the Radio 4 audience, that's orthodoxy. The <laughs> idea that Nigel Farage literally deserves to have life-changing injuries is Radio 4 comedy orthodoxy. Mm. That is, that's as straight down the line as you can get, you know. To have said on heresy, I don't know, I quite like Nigel Farage, you know, he looks like he'd be a nice bloke to have a pint with, you know, that would be heresy. You could have told immediately from the audience reaction, I suspect, that you had now transgressed, seriously, mm. you know, but you won't get that. No, because you'll never get booked again. <laughs> 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 but I was going to say, do you think there is a bias in comedy, Simon, with, with you know, left-leaning liberal comedians getting the majority of the airwaves? And this there are all sorts of different aspects of that question. I think that, I do think that the BBC struggles to find uh, even centrist comedians, I would say. I mean, I don't expect to see right wing like the kind of old fashioned, you know, Jim Davison or whatever, right mm. wing or the, the, the sensibilities and the subtext, you know, that you might call racist or whatever, underlying those kind of jokes. But they struggle to find anyone who who challenges the, I guess, the kind of campus politics that seem to dominate, you know, the fringes now. I'm in, a, in a different context on social media, where I spend far too much time on Twitter, it's obviously part of the of the whole proposition of Twitter and the whole dynamics and the algorithms and everything that drives everything to the extremes. Because nobody's interested in a moderate view. People are far more likely to click and repeat and respond and retweet to anyone kind of going, you know, I am insanely mad, yeah. at, you know, at this violation of my rights, you know. And um, or, or completely poo-pooing them, and and it does seem to me that comedy is not, you know, the world of comedy is not reflecting both sides of that argument at the moment. You know, so to the extent that these arguments are taking place on the fringes at all, there is an awful lot of comedy which doesn't concern itself with these sort of things at all. You know, and that's that's fine. But it is interesting. For instance, I'm, and I, this is not a slam dunk argument, but just one kind of symptom. Mock the week traditionally, you'll have six comedians on there, Daro Brian. I know, for instance, uh, and I hope they won't mind me saying so, Gary Delaney, for instance, is at least centrist, I would say a little bit right of centre with his politics and is quite interested in libertarian ideas. He's quite interested in investing in gold because he believes that fiat currency is potentially... You Big know, fan of the fragile. show, by the way, Gary. Yeah, How are you doing, yeah, yeah. 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 Won't So like he has those that. ideas, you know. <laughs> yeah. He won't do any of that on Mock the Week. He just does terrific... His puns, his jokes are fantastic, and that is his stock in trade, but none of them have that subtext. They are all just kind of... 
you know, like kind of slightly off colour <laughs> <laughs> references to uh, sexual picadillos or whatever. Mm. Milton Jones, another one. Again, I know his politics centrist. He's very intelligent, interesting guy in real life. But the character he plays on Mock the Week and on stage is, again, basically about one-liners that are of a craziness, you know. Whereas the left-leaning comedians, you know, if you get somebody on there like Chris Addison or whatever, when he used to do it, you know, who are able to kind of basically use that that platform to undermine the, the notion that UKIP is a remotely sort of when when it, or the, you know prior to Brexit that that was a remotely feasible proposition are quite comfortable in, in in expressing their views. So there's a bias to that extent. I'm not saying that there are no right wing comedians, but the, the extent to which they feel the natural liberty that, that they feel that their license is granted to express those views. And that, of course, then drives the audience in a certain direction. And audiences, and it's not, I don't think, insulting to audiences to say this, it's just you can be part of this audience yourself. But the dynamics of audiences are that they coalesce into a single body. I mean, that's sort of what the job of the compare is in a comedy club, is to kind of get them into a herd-like format. If every, if every audience, <laughs> if every audience <laughs> is the thinking for themselves, for the is seeping out of if you have to have that, because if every audience is thinking for themselves independently, is that funny making a decision? Mm. Then, you know, it becomes very choppy, you know, and you do get heckling, of course, at that point, because people feel quite capable of speaking against the, the grain of the, of the crowd. So you need that. And, of course, if the audience is being... You know, driven along, you know, the the the, the driveway in a uh, in a certain direction, and then one comedian stands up and goes, "No, that way." You know, you don't get the same laugh because you're not keeping the flywheel spinning. You're you're putting a spanner in the works, and that's a very different dynamic. In any, it can be exciting, you know. And if you're a terrific comedian, if you were a George Carlin and you were invited onto that show, and you had the confidence and the and the vocabulary to, you know, expose the political uh, orthodoxies and the, the callowness of the, of the views being, you know, expressed for what they are, then you could potentially create, you know, milestone television. But the, but the, the, the chances are you, it will just, everyone will go, uh, what is, is, seems, that doesn't work. That's not what mm. we thought we were all believed, mm. you know, and it all just sort of peters to a halt. Mm. But isn't that the role of the comedian? Yeah, so it should be, shouldn't it? Yeah. You would, well, I mean, the comedians work in a number of different formats. It's not necessarily the role of the panel game. I mean, the role of the Mock the Week, you know, I think it's realistic to say is to entertain people, and it does a tremendously good job. The joke rate is ferocious, you know. The number of laughs per minute you get on a show like Mock the Week it sort of almost killed the sitcom flat, really. You know, those, you know, they were very, very, very funny. You know, you get, and, and of course, then all those comedians. Um, bantering among each other creates a sort of nice, you kind of want to be part of that gang, you know. So that's what that show is for. It's not that show's job to challenge, or to, even though it might like to wear the clothes of, of like, uh, you know, uh, of something that, you know, that is the job. Of, but yes, to be a George Carlin, you know, to really stand up and, and tear down all the sacred idols, not just the, not just those of the right or the left, you know. He was every bit as much an enemy of the, the sacred idols of the of the left, you know. A lot of his took that many of his famous his, um, quotation was it political correctness is fascism pre pretending to be politeness something like that you know he was he was quite on it the whole time he went into his 60s and 70s but um nowadays the the opportunities to get in front of an audience and say that kind of mm. stuff are, are are fewer you know mm. somebody like Stuart Lee has his you know those shows were were tremendous in which he unpacks a lot of the uh subtext of a Richard Littlejohn article or whatever you know and that's very effective and he's a very good comedian he's a very intelligent guy and he takes his time and he trusts the audience to come with him on a journey and I don't want to see the back of him by any means I just think it would be quite useful to have the right wing equivalent of that but there is a sort of presumption now Partly, I think, to be honest, um, you know, uh, reinforced by things that Stuart Lee has said, you know, that it's not, it just couldn't be that there is no, I, we couldn't have a right wing intelligent comment, you know, because because the right wing is the voice of privilege and the voice of power and something. Well, that's just nonsense. It isn't at all. The right wing can be the voice of tradition who are being trammeled at the moment, you know. Traditions are being, are being obliterated, you know. Anyone, for instance, who has a traditional view of gender, sex and and what it is to be a man or a woman, their views are currently literally unsayable on, on the BBC. You can actually be you know, held up and arraigned in, in, a, in the court of public opinion for having the view that a man is what is a biological man. Now, that is a traditional point of view, and whether or not it's right or not, it's a point of view which somebody should be able to express without feeling 
anxious, I would have thought, you know, and yet, and that is no longer the case. So having the idea that the, the, the the, the right wing comedian is essentially the voice of the bankers. That's just nonsense. You know, mm -hmm. that isn't what right wing comedy is. Right wing comedy can be any number of things. It could be like expressing the views of, of G.K. Chesterton, you know, or, or expressing the views of, of Rudyard Kipling, you know, these kind of, and these people were very funny, you know, but they essentially had a tragic view of the essence of human nature as fundamentally unsavable and, you know, progress being necessarily. Um, uh, contingent to some extent. But increasingly now as well, it could just be the the voice of the socially conservative people, yes. which is working class people. Yes, exactly. You know? And it's interesting, as you were talking there, one of the things I was thinking about is the most successful right wing comedian in this country now is Jeff Norcott. Yes. And Jeff is very mild in his right wingness. Do yes. you know what I'm saying? Yes. He's someone who can take a whole audience along with him, even if they are left wing, yeah. which is great. He's a very skilled comedian. Uh, but you don't have someone who is slaying the sacred cows of the left. No. Uh, in the same way that Stuart Lee would, would do to the right. No, and he doesn't dismantle that to no. the same extent. He's, as you're right, he's very good and he's, he's nailed what he is. And you're right, it's socially conservative. He's probably, I guess it's that old grid, isn't it? And so in economic terms, he's probably still on the, it was, you know, the old traditional, you know, my old man's a dustman, that mm. kind of mentality, basically, who have been abandoned, of course, if you look on that grid and how, the MPs in the House of Commons, they are all in that in the, the quarter from sort of midday around to 9 p.m. Nobody is in that top left quarter, which is like left wing fiscally, but but, but socially conservative. And that is a huge, um, yeah, that's a, a massive slice of the British public who have felt neglected and, and arguably voted for Brexit just to express their discontent with the status quo. You know, regardless of whether they felt they'd properly identified its route. <laughs> and voted Brexit Party in the EU elections, and you get yeah. Labour voters turn around and calling them racist. But anyway. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is Labour's massive problem now, isn't it? Of course, the Tories have massive problems too, but the Labour's massive problem is that they're trying to split between the, those two massively opposing camps. They had, in the post war consensus, managed to combine that to create a coalition of the socially conservative and the more sort of intellectual, you know, degree. Uh, uh, power, you know, uh, the, the credentialism of of like left wing thought, you know, that um, that but has different views and and wants to lift oppression from increasingly more sort of narrowly defined intersectional groups. Hmm. But so we, what we're talking about is is very very interesting because you know we're saying that there's no figure on the right, and do you think it's because comedians self centre because they go if I'm actually going to be honest about what I think and what I believe my career will be stunted and curtailed as a result. I think it's perfectly conceivable that such a comedian exists, <laughs> yes. I don't know how often or how many. I mean, part of the problem is, of course, that you don't see them. Mm. But it might be, of course, that you, that sort of person is not drawn to comedy now. Mm. Yeah. They might think, I mean, and there are plenty of people like yourself who are able to, to, to blog, you know, and it's mm. not quite the same as being on Live at the Apollo, but, you know, you can, you can make uh, you video content. <laughs> you, know, yeah. so you can make content one way or another. You might sell books. You look at Andrew Doyle, for instance. Mm. He's written that book, Titania mm. McGrath has become an internet sensation, and he's sold a lot of books. You know, he, again, he probably won't get the same sort of TV coverage, you know. But he's certainly angered the left. You know, they are, some of them are furious. There's a guy, the uh, assistant editor of the New Statesman, I think, who's uh, George John Elledge. Uh, no, not oh, George Eaton, oh. but John Elledge. Yeah, oh. I, I might have his job title wrong, but fairly senior figure there, who said, I will block anyone who retweets that account. You know, and he wasn't joking. I mean, he sounded <laughs> like absurdly, you might say snowflake, but he is basically <laughs> threatening people with losing access to a senior figure in the political journalist, you know, of sphere because they've retweeted a comedy account which is taking the piss out of left-wing orthodoxy. So he's obviously, you know, he's riled some people, which is great, but that's not, he would go down that route, you know. And there are lots of other things you could do as well, of course. And other people might say, you know, yes, the right wing, you know, they are, they're not struggling as much as you think. And they, you have this whole intellectual dark web thing. Mm. Which is an hilarious, very interesting phenomenon. I mean, I've been following Jordan Peterson for many years, and I think he's a tremendous live speaker, really compelling, because he's he's thinking in real time and he's addressing real problems and trying to use his intelligence and his store of knowledge to produce coherent answers to real questions. You know, that I find interesting in itself. It's not because it, necessarily because he's you know I didn't even really register that he was that conservative really mm. to begin with, but I see it now. But some of the people that gather, that gather around him, I think, are more opportunist. Dave Rubin, for instance, who runs this kind of very successful podcast, very possibly a sort of template for, for what you guys are trying to do here. It's, I mean, he gets like a million hits per show or whatever. It's a very, very 
successful format, but I'm not sure whether his heart is quite as much in the in the advancement of human knowledge so much as it is in the advancement of Dave Rubin. <laughs> That's understandable. I love the way that Simon's you know, laid that out and yeah. put us <laughs> yes. as the template for that. Listen, I wouldn't Sorry. blame anyone if you managed to crack it. It was like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, every ch British chat show wanted to be Letterman, right? Mm. Yeah. Jonathan Ross wanted to be Letterman and eventually sort of basically cracked it, but for a lot of them went through it and Jonathan Ross had a couple of misfires as well and Johnny Vaughan and so on. Nowadays, I think everyone looks at it. I do too. I'd like to be Joe Rogan, who I think mm. is the, the real deal. Mm. And I think Dave Rubin, he's a smart enough guy, but I think there is a little bit of kind of, he likes to sell the whole I'm heretical, you know, I'm heterodox uh, thing a little bit hard, whereas Joe Rogan just gets on and does it. But I mean, Joe Rogan is probably the single biggest chat show in 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 the world right now you know mm. that's probably bigger than leno or i don't even know if leno still is one is mm. it or mm. you know most of them like uh Jimmy Jimmy Kimmel. 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 yeah exactly yeah. they're very they're showbiz they're part of the showbiz you know um process everyone comes on it's like graham norton they're very enjoyable you get to see your favorite stars mm. laughing and telling slightly off-color jokes but it's all part of the promotional package isn't it whereas joe it's all rogan fake. It's he's all, all fake. totally fake absolutely and everything is judged you know, in terms of numbers. Joe Rogan is like creating some of the most compelling conversations that are happening right now mm. and talking to real intellectuals. And the fact that the guy is, a, is an MMA commentator mm. turned stand-up comedian who mainly, but you know, will happily talk about his testosterone uh, supplements and, and going elk hunting with a, with a <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a fascinating character, yeah. you know. So that is, I mean, there is that option. And those guys, nobody who goes on there is at all afraid of speaking their mind and expressing mm. right-wing, left-wing. And Joe will call them on it if it's bullshit, of course. Yeah. That's the great thing. Joe is intelligent enough to go, I don't think that's true, is it? You know, mm. I think actually if you look at the figures, mm. it's been net migration across the border in the other way or whatever. You know, he yeah. will yeah. call them if they come on with their... But, you know, it's just, I, there's quite a small uh, traditional platform in the UK, I say traditional in, in the, over the last 20 years or whatever for stand-up comedians to operate within and within that I think there is a bit of gatekeeping going on, yes, mm. I do think and that is partly because if you run a club or run a show, it helps if the audience know roughly what they're going to get, I'm afraid. And the idea that people like having their views challenged in comedy, I'm afraid is, I'm afraid that's a fairy tale. People like having their views reinforced. They laugh much harder when something they already think is demonstrated as true in a fictional anecdote with a punchline. Yes, that is absolutely true. And how much do you think the Edinburgh Festival plays into this? Edinburgh Festival, which is home to the, you know, the white uh, upper middle classes, yeah. you know, lefty liberal. Liberal, you know, yeah, let's, yeah. Uh... But also, it is heterodox in the sense that people come in from all around the world as well, mm. I suppose. And also, American tourists have always been important. Yeah. The, usually, the, the, uh, the, whether the book's balance at the end of the Edinburgh Festival is often to do with whether we had good relations with uh, America in this sort of uh, year building up to it. Really? Or whatever, you know. Well, after, for instance, after 9-11, there was a serious plummet because uh, they were all afraid of flying, literally, or of, of European terrorism. And mm. every time there's a serious outrage, you know, that kind of... And, and Americans, I think, are a little bit less. I think, you know, middle aged Americans are quite happy to go and see uh, heterodox views. And actually, funnily enough, although we think of Americans as being more sort of stupid and, and more, you know, feedlot mentality, but actually there, there's a libertarian streak in American mm. comedy. And they can support. I mean, like Bill Burr, who would probably be my absolute hero in terms of just like saying it like he sees it and, and not giving a damn how it's taken. And he's plow playing stadiums. I don't. I think I'd be surprised if a Bill Burr could emerge from Essex, you know. Which is, is he's not a New Yorker. He's, I think he's from Boston, Connecticut. Yeah, 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 Boston, yeah, 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 yeah. And he's got that kind of whiny bias, like <laughs> you know. It's not like a mellifluous. He's not like a you know yeah. sort of thing. This is true, really. You know, he's a fucking powerhouse. He's an amazing comic, and he is prepared to go places where very few others are. Yeah. And then he takes you with him because it's all vulnerable and because he has that whiny voice and he sounds like he's probably getting put upon and he's probably made some dumb choices in his time himself, you know. It's hard to picture him going back to a really plush pad or whatever, you know, even though he, I'm sure can't afford one now. <laughs> so, you know, I think there's people like that come out of America, you know, uh, uh, somewhat to where our, we had 20 years when we were producing, you know, it was a bit, it's a bit like rock music in the 60s, I think. You know, the, the America and Great Britain are always the great 
seesawing entities of these things, you know. You, there was that period when, when British rock music ruled America, so obviously the Beatlemania and the Stones, you know, and then they came back with Credence, but then in the 70s we had Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin. Zeppelin were easily the biggest band in America. Most of them thought they were American, you know, they were so massive there, you know. And again, it's happened with, with, with comedy. We had some really great years, you know, Eddie Izzard and, and Harry Hill, and there were some really creative voices, you know, but I think at the moment, possibly the more creative stuff, or the more honest, truth stuff is, is possibly happening over there again now. And, and you said that you, you couldn't imagine a Bill Burr coming from the UK. Why is that, Simon? I can't imagine him being accepted as, as much, you know. I, can't, I, I mean, he is a really singularly talented individual, mm. you know, so maybe if somebody that good and that honest and that with, you know, as they, there's a saying, you know, not giving a damn what people think is a superpower. And that, I think there's some real truth in that. If you genuinely don't care and you, this is your truth and you're going to tell it, you know, that really will just dissolve a lot of doors that you might have thought were shut. But I have, you know, it's been some time now and I haven't seen one. I haven't seen many that really kind of come out, you know, fighting on that side. You know, the, the idea that, um, I guess they would call it red-pilled, you know, in, mm. in, in short terms, you know, just pushing back against the idea that men, white, white men have all the, you know, have all the cards and have all the oppression opportunities and, and none of the burden, you know, and he's just kicking back against that. Well, I mean, that is, that is properly unorthodox at the but moment. But you're going to get crushed if you do that yeah. on the comedy circuit in this country as a newer comedian. Yeah. You, you, you're not going to work. You have to be really strong and really, and really, you know, care. Yeah. 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 I mean, I guess in, you might say the strongest similarity would be Andrew Lawrence, who was mm. who was brave enough, and also incidentally Ginger, you know, which <laughs> may, <laughs> may have something to do with it. I don't know. Maybe that prepares you for some of life's not. I don't know. But, uh, well, what but happened to him? He hasn't. Yeah, he hasn't had. I mean, he tours, and I think he does okay. And he did not give a damn. I think when he produced his famous Facebook screed, he <laughs> ill-advisedly conflated some genuine concerns with some random ad hominems that didn't help his. Case and alienated a lot of potential allies, you know, and made it impossible for a lot of us to say, I think he's right there, I think he's wrong there, because mm -hmm. you just don't want to, you know, if you touch that kind of stuff, it's toxic at that mm. point, you know. I feel a bit sorry for him in that respect, but, but a lot of what he said, you know, uh, chimed, a lot of what he said did sound like a bitter rant from somebody who was blaming everyone but himself for a failure to enjoy the... I mean, a lot of people have had those moments where they think their career is going to really take off mm. and then it doesn't. I remember Adam Bloom, for instance. I hope he won't mind me saying this because I've talked to him about it. There were a few years at Edinburgh when we thought Adam Bloom would be like a, a household name worldwide, you know, and then things level off a bit and you have to adapt to that and, and accept, you know, the new reality and work around it. And I think Andrew Lawrence had a little bit of that when he started, possibly, and then didn't you know, and then it's quite easy to kind of go, why am I not on every show? You know, that's the trouble. When there are now loads of comedians and loads of panel games, you, it, you have to avoid that kind of actor's mentality. Every actor, you know, there's like 10 actors for every job, you know, probably 30 or 40 for every good job. And it's really a, a, a challenge if you want to make a living as an actor, not to be going, why isn't that me? Why didn't that, you know, because that kind of stuff just eats into the soul. So there was always that, there, there was a little bit of contamination from that thinking, I think. But, um, yeah, I mean, and uh, the trouble is, of course, with a show like Unleashed, which, as you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to headline that, but there is a danger with that, that it becomes this kind of, you know, oh, we're dangerous, we're edgy, and then everyone goes, and it's like, well, it's not really. It's just a show where, where comedians feel less policed mm. than they might do. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to run on stage and start, you know. I was, there's that danger of that kind of Bill Grundy Sex Pistols interview where he goes, go on then, say something rude. You know what I mean? And you, you nasty fucker or whatever it was, you know. <laughs> there's this kind of, oh God, you know, is yeah. this what, is this yeah. all it is? You know. But that's not what Unleashed is at all. No. The thing with Unleashed is the whole point of it is just you don't self-censor. Exactly. If you yeah. think something is funny. Yeah. And that's what we do. I mean, we go on stage yeah. to be funny. We don't go on there to preach our political opinions. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Uh, well, unless you're a left-wing comedian. <laughs> 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 Delivering truth bullets. <laughs> but yes, you're, un you're uncensored, and that's good. But if you find yourself uncensored, and then you find yourself not being that transgressive anyway, but funny, yeah. that's, that's still fine, isn't yeah. it? It's, that's, it's the, the capacity of people to... Misinterp willfully misinterpret it as this kind of, oh, we're wild and crazy, we don't care what we think, you know, and then of course there's going to be a, an anticlimax because, you know, what, how can you live up to that? It, but, but really, what you're saying should be the norm. That's the mm. point, isn't it? That's mm. what comedy clubs mm. should be. That should be the default method, mm. you know, and there should be one or two comedy clubs 
where they say, if you are of a slightly nervous disposition, and without mis meaning to you know, misuse the word, if you might be triggered by a reference to a sexual assault, then this is the sort of comedy club where you can go and I assure you it's going to be, you know, all the material has been vetted and you're not going to encounter anything that is, I don't actually have a problem with that. If that's what people want, I think that's fine. What, what I've always, I think the distinction is that you are not allowed to impose that rule across a university campus and say no event is to take place here, which might trigger anyone who has been given a warning that that might be triggering to them and, and is told to keep away. Do you know what I mean? That's yes. the difference, mm, you know. Absolutely. I don't have any problem with safe spaces within a larger space where you're entitled to go and, you know, I don't think, it, I wouldn't advise my children if they went to university to, to avoid encountering views that they might find challenging but you know I might say to them you know, I might say to my daughter don't necessarily try and inveigle your way into the rugby club you know and because you might find some of their jokes are a bit you know disrespectful of <laughs> women <laughs> I think guys are allowed to have a space where they're also is a safe space for them to just let off traditional steam if it then gets out of hand you know I don't know I mean I just don't feel like it's for me to police that mm. kind of stuff. You no, know? you need to get the Met to do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah to, to call up and check their yes. thing. <laughs> as, as happens nowadays. But it's interesting on your Bill Burr point. I was actually thinking that I love Bill Burr. I'm a huge yeah. fan of Bill Burr. He is relatively unknown in the UK, actually. He can sell well when he comes, but it's not, people don't use his name, no. No, um, what I'm saying is lots of us know him. Yeah. Uh, and we might go and see a show and pay 50 quid for a ticket and bring five friends. But if you say to an ordinary person who's not a comedy aficionado in this country, Michael McIntyre, everyone knows who he is. Yeah. Right? If you say to them, Bill Burr, no one does. Which American comedians do you think? I guess Chris Rock, they would yeah. say. Chris Rock. Chris Rock. Who else? Um, Dave Chappelle. Uh, Dave yes. Chappelle. Yeah. yeah. So, and he's very good. He, and yes. they're both. In fact, funny enough, Chris Rock. I mean, this is a really good example. I watched Chris Rock's most recent show. What was it called? Uh, had a funny name like a Windmill or something. Or, yeah. Do you remember the one I mean? Yes, I know the one or you mean. Kaleidoscope or something. Yeah, like yeah. It was named after a sort of childhood toy type thing. Yeah. Like anyway, really good show. I thought, well, really good. I would, by Chris Rock's, you know, highly elevated standards, I would say it was a medium to good show. But mm. by almost anybody else's standards, it would be tremendous. But he got away with stuff that I would never be able to get away with. And no white comedian would be able to get away with in this country in terms of sexual politics, not in terms of race. Obviously, you can get away with stuff in terms of race, mm. you know, because that's that is the deal. And that I, I completely sign up to. But also he can kind of go, if a guy has a new girlfriend, his friends will say, what does she look like? If a, if a girl has a new boyfriend, her friends will say, what does he earn? What does he do? Mm -hmm. Now that is, well, you can say whether that's funny or not, that's a subjective choice, but there is no way a white comedian would get away with that. Really? Like, you think I, so? I don't think so, no, no, mm. absolutely. Different standards there, definitely. And I don't, it may just be because he's of these, the context of his own personal hinterland and his mm. reputation for telling it like it is, mm. you know. But I think there's a lot more. I, I mean, maybe I'll get into trouble for saying this, I don't know, but I think there is a lot more willingness within the black community to be realistic about small-scale sexual politics, not like in the workplace, but just like what relationships are like. Whereas white liberal orthodoxy about not like uttering anything that might suggest that there is any sexual dimorphism in psychological terms <laughs> is like anathema now. I think but, it's you know, broader I, than that. Chris Rockwood did it really well, you know. But I, I'm not, I don't begrudge him. I'm glad he did it, you know, mm. just saying. I, I, I guess I feel it's even broader than that. Like what, one of the, the things I talk about on stage is someone saying to me, go back to Russia, you pack it. I fucking apologize Whoa. for that. How many times? <laughs> 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 Jesus, you right. always bring if it up. If it hadn't been for that, <laughs> yeah. you would never have met. Yeah, yeah. Right. there you are. Right. Yeah. And and I, I and I have dark skin, and I talk about this in in my set, and usually it goes down very well, especially in Kent. <laughs> right? But but seriously though, it's it's almost all. If there is any tension in the room, yeah, it's never from the ethnic minorities. No, it's never the Asian people. Yeah. It's never the black people. They're always laughing because they recognize the ridiculousness yeah, yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah. But also the truth of and it. And let's break the tension. Right. That's what they want. Yeah. But it's always the white middle yeah. class liberal people. Speaking on other people, begin taking offense on other people. Right, yeah. I mean, we've been talking about this for, God, it feels at least like a decade this has been a phenomenon, right? Mm. People taking offense on other people's behalves. At least, I don't know how long, but would you say? No, I, 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 I just became aware of it over a far shorter period of time. No, at least a decade I've known that, really? that is, and in America more as well, but mm. yeah, that the liberal thing is to take offense on other people's behalves, mm. definitely, yeah. I, think, I don't know, it's very interesting. There is a book, 
called The Suicide of the West. I know there are at least three books called The Suicide of the West, and I <laughs> discovered the other two when a recent one came out. The recent one is by a guy called Jonah Goldberg, who is, uh, I guess, a, a right-wing, but proper, you know, serious, not like uh, remotely foaming. He writes for National Review, but he's, uh, you know, he's a, he seems like a nice guy. He was talking about the collapse in, of confidence in, I guess, what the, the values of Western civilization, such as democracy and free thought and so on, and everything like that. And then I went onto Amazon to see whether to buy this book, and there were other older ones. And it's interesting, it's one of those things that people have been calling for a long time, that, you know, the suicide of the West, have we lost confidence as a civilization? And the first one was written by a guy called James Burnham, who was originally like a, a Trotskyite in the 30s, you know, American Trotskyite, I think he was American anyway, certainly settled there eventually, and then, and then switched over to, to the right, you know, in the post-war era and, and wrote this book in about 1948 or something like that, basically around the time of the foundation of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially analyzing the world political drift in terms of the loss of confidence of the West against communism at that point. There was no mention of Islam, of course, which is nowadays seen as the, 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 the you know, the growing in confidence thing. And it's really interesting because you just see the same arguments coming up there, you know, and the same concerns. And he actually, his analysis is very cool. It's well written. And he essentially sees it as, he sees liberal politics as a way of post-rationalizing the decline of the West. So he doesn't really see it as causing the decline of the West. He sees it as the symptoms of it. Mm. And he sees it a way of uh, liberals understanding their loss of power in terms of a deliberate choice on their part to share that power. So rather than kind of going, we are losing strength, we are losing the argument, we are losing the will to conquer uh, and to win these arguments worldwide, rather we would rather engage in a kind of pluralism and a kind of moral relativism which allows us to understand what is happening in the world as something other than an abject defeat <laughs> which is a really interesting argument mm. you know and it's a really good book i recommend it but it's i mean it's almost like that you know those things that go all the way back to socrates kids today they got no respect you know that's mm. uh, mm. you know those things are eternal it's a bit like that but I'm not saying it's not true either. So he would he identified that, you know, as people taking offense on other people's, you know, behalf, absolutely. And there are there are many great thinkers. Thomas Sowell is probably mm. the single strongest uh, voice on in African American sort of thinking for me on that front, you know, and he just has no time at all for that shit. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is it's refreshing when you see people like that because I think as we talk about orthodoxy, yeah, that is the orthodoxy of our time. Yeah. Certainly in a comedy scene or comedy environment in a comedy club, that that is very much the way of thinking, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And an audience afraid to laugh. Analysis has been done of, of audiences, uh, you know, using cameras and, and microphones and so on to see who laughs first and where and when. And there are certain people within an audience who seem to give the rest of the audience permission to laugh. And I've noticed this doing corporates, which is corpor corporates is a slightly heightened environment in that respect. And also, of course, you have total control because there's no compare. Mm. There's no earlier act who's taking it in this direction or that direction. Mm. You're taking a, an audience fresh. All they've heard previously is some announcements about you know, uh, who's won such and such an award or whatever. Mm. And um, and you quite quickly have to identify who might, who in the room might be the guys. Or if, Very often, if it's a mixed audience, the women are more likely to have control over giving permission to the men to laugh rather than vice versa. <laughs> and that, that is a proven fact in, in um, I've read research, I think it was a uh, University of Kent that actually conducted quite a significant, you know, um, experiment within the comedy store and played, you know, like regular comedy clubs as well. Mm that many, many more times the men would glance quickly at their wives or girlfriends to see if they were laughing and enjoying it, a comedian, before they could start to laugh. And if they thought, they wouldn't check on every joke, but at the beginning, once you've got the core proposition of this comedian, mm. Mm. is this guy okay? Yeah, okay, we like him. You know, there was a little bit of nervousness on that front, you right. know. It's obviously, you could then say, why is that? Why is the balance of power? Is it that the woman is later going to be able to withhold sex? If, if she's, if, I can't believe you laughed at that man. Thank, thank you for Whatever. making that explicit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are we saying that? I don't know, because it might be something else. It might be that he just doesn't have the confidence to know whether he's going to make an ass of himself by laughing at this yeah. guy, yeah. because he might trust her to be more intelligent or to be more emotionally intelligent, which I think is a perfectly reasonable alternative and slightly less mm. transactional. Mm. <laughs> you know? yeah. But anyway... 
in corporates, you get them and, you, and they're very often the boss, you know, and if the boss sits at the front table and often he'll come and go, anyway, now it's some entertainment for you, a very funny man, uh, snom, uh, Simon, Simon Evans, Simon yeah. Evans, yes, you'll yeah. have heard of him, of course, you know, and it's a terrible introduction yes. or whatever, yeah. and he'll then sit down and then fall asleep. You know, or, or just sit there looking stony faced at every remark you make. And of course, this quickly sweeps around the room, you know, that this guy, if he makes, if he goes, ladies and gentlemen, a real treat for you now. I listen to this guy on the radio all the time. He's one of my absolute favorites. And I think you're going to enjoy him too. Please welcome Simon Evans. And he sits down there and starts roaring with laughter. The whole room goes up. And I wish I could say to them, you know, explicitly do that. You know, but of course, then it's kind of cheating. But yeah. yeah. But One way is to speak to them, of mm. course, and, and get them engaged and let at least the audience know that they're happy with that and tease them. I'll tell you who's a past master athlete, Dominic Holland, who mm. is, um, again, a guy who doesn't get as much airtime as he used to or, or, or deserves, in my view. But he's made a very good career at, at making himself known as somebody who is a very safe pair of hands in a, in a corporate setting. And he has that way of just gently mocking the brass, you know, the, the mm. higher ranks. He will just gently mock them enough for the audience to laugh, but not so that they'll kind of go, oh, Christ, you can't mention that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Don't mention the divorce. Yeah. <laughs> so he's brilliant. Mind you, Do uh, Dominic's son is Spider Man. Yes. So I think. <laughs> but even before he knew he had a uh, ticket. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I, we've got about 15 minutes left, Simon. Okay. I, I wanted to uh, ask you about there's this concept for anyone who is not a comedy kind of aficionado, there's this concept of punching up and punching down. Yes. And just to briefly to break it down, at least this is my understanding. Punching up is when you're making jokes about the powerful, like the boss yes, in this example, right, yeah. or, or straight white men who have all the... the it was called to, to comfort, satire is supposed to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, right? Yes, so right. Punching up, yeah. Yeah. And punching down would be, you know, a straight white man making fun of a disabled woman. Yeah, yeah. It, right? Yeah. That, and, and, and this is the... the number one way of judging comedy now. Yes, which requires you to be familiar with intersectional point scoring and lead tables <laughs> and so on. But, yeah. but, but even if you are familiar with them, it strikes me that there's quite a contradiction there because, for example, a straight, white, middle-class, Etonian, uh, old Etonian, university-educated man yeah. punching Doris from Macclesfield yeah. for being racist for voting Brexit, yeah. that's considered punching up at the yes. racist yes. Doris from Macclesfield. Yes. Even though on the intersection intersectionality scale, I mean, I don't understand who's more vulnerable than than a pensioner. Gordon Brown in the back of a cab referring to a bigoted woman was yeah. that was that punching up or punching down? It's a good question, isn't it? That right. was almost that was almost the question, I suppose, yeah. wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I was on a Jeff Norcott podcast recently. We talked about this. I think it's a, um, I know Chris Rock, I think, uh, uh, originated the phrase to, to try and explain how he felt comfortable doing it. I don't think he ever in turn intended to make this the deep, you know, the uh, metric by which all other comedians are judged. But for me, in my routines, I like to present a boxing match. That's what I was saying to Jeff, and I, I, I said it in real time, and on reflection, I'm sticking with it. <laughs> like, one of my more kind of like, uh, my wife refers it to my hate crime material, you know, when I start doing stuff that's like, might be sound like it was punching down. I do a routine, it starts with a joke about three men in a hospital there to collect their babies, and ah, there's yes. confusion, and then the punchline is, um, one of those two in there is Welsh, and I'm not taking any chances, right? So the joke mm. is at the expense of the Welsh. Yeah. It's a big relief, because the other man in the joke was a Pakistani, and yeah. so you're going, oh, Oh, well, God, at least it wasn't you know, yeah, yeah, racist. Yeah. So that plays with people. I think it plays with people's sensibilities already because you're going, oh, it's all right because it's the Welsh. Is it? Mm. Then in the course of the kind of aftershocks, because I always think once you've got a good punchline up, you need to kind of like try and, you know, follow it up with, mm. with the toppers. I like to think it swings back and forth. You know, I describe interactions I've had with Welsh audiences where I've come off the worst or where I've suddenly woken up to their trenchant, hostility towards a middle-class Englishman or whatever, you know, it swings back and forth. I may get the upper hand, but it's a proper, it's a match. Do you know what I mean? I'm mm. the victim in one line and then in the next mm -hmm. line I come back again, you know. Now that, and I did the same thing more historically with Geordies. Again, there's a kind mm. of, you know, I'm laughing at them. For, and it's, I mean, it's very, the, the, the actual basic, basic material is, is very stereotypical that they tend to be indifferent to cold weather. That was that was it, really, that they just don't wear jackets. I mean, that's the most root one observation about Geordies, but you just stay with it long enough and see if you can't get something new out of it. Half the jokes, I hope, were at the expense of my sort of befuddled, slightly Michael Palin-esque, you know, um, would-be tolerant and... Uh, 
you know, curious traveller in foreign lands, trying to understand the culture of these mm. people and treating them as if they were some remote tribe or something, mm -hmm. whereas in mm. fact they're part of the United Kingdom. Mm. So it's a, a much a different, but that's the thing, it's supposed to swing back and forth. If you're relentlessly punching up or down, you are still just relentlessly punching someone. And that isn't funny, you know. They have to get the old punch back. And yes. I think that's the key. And mm. then it doesn't matter so much, you yeah. know. And then you don't have to start getting your intersectional Olympic tables out, you know, and working out whether this was a, an acceptable victim. But, but there are, there, there, do you ever feel times that, especially when you're doing, so for instance, a sort of classic, you know, woke audience, yeah. that you find yourself censoring going, this joke, I stand by it, there's nothing wrong with it, but I simply can't do it because I know that I'm going to lose them. I would, I would do a joke if I knew that the joke was good, mm. but what will happen if I sense that they're significantly left of my views and are finding this uncomfortable is what will dry up is the little witty off the cuff asides and, and in the moment toppers and, and extras, which are actually, that's a real shame because that is what really makes a gig. You know, mm. those little asides are what, why an Edinburgh show will start you know, on the 1st of August with maybe 30 or 40 good laughs and hopefully have a couple of hundred good laughs by the end of it because mm. each time you add a little thing that you think of in the mm. moment, you know, all the good writing happens on stage. And if you've got an audience that you feel is hostile to your core proposition, then you're not going to be doing any good writing on stage unless you decide to go, fuck you. <laughs> you know, I'm going out in a blaze yeah. of glory. But yeah. I am not that guy, I'm afraid, you know, not generally speaking. And I don't want people who've paid money to come to a comedy show to have their faces ground into my, you know, person. Because I'm not even sure that I'm right, of course. Mm. You know, yeah. it's all just for a laugh. So, yes, you'll try and steer it away to stuff that we can all laugh about, you know. But it is a shame if you get that. And sometimes only one or two people, again, policing the audience. A, an audible, sharp intake of breath. Mm. I really detest that because that isn't actually an honest expression of your, of your reaction. It's an attempt to stop everyone else enjoying this. Do you want know I mean? If, if, yes, you, yes, if you play, yes, if you if you do an audience, for instance, I might do a show. I did one recently in Holmfirth in, in Yorkshire. It went really well. It was absolutely delighted with it. It was like one of the last dates of my genius tour, one of the sort of aftershocks. Mm. And they were a really good audience. But there was just one line when I made a joke at the expense of the north-south divide and the kind of failure of communication. But somebody in the audience sort of attempted to take it as if I was just insulting Yorkshire, as mm. if I was condescending to Yorkshire, you know, seriously rather than ironically, and did that kind of... And luckily, the rest of the audience went, fuck off, that was a joke, you <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, yeah. And, and it was fine. But that's what they were trying to do, mm. even if they weren't consciously trying to do it. That's mm. what that communicates. And that does anger me because, you know, nobody needs that in the room. You decide for yourself. If you don't like a joke, that's fine. But you start drawing, doing those things, and everyone then starts to feel a little bit, oh, I better not laugh because they didn't like it, and I'm not sure now if we're on. Do you know what I mean? And that, yeah, that's, totally. you know, that's... That's that can be that can like slow you down. That can freeze things up, and and then you just start to sort of run on three cylinders instead of four, and it's you you're kind of policing yourself all the time, and that's no good. I was going to ask you the reason I brought up the punching up and punching down thing is I yeah. think you're someone uh, who is a great example of brilliant comedy that is based. I mean, if you write it down and you read it out in the cold light of a morning breakfast show yeah. to to an audience that is woke, uh, the, the, you you make jokes that. Uh, extremely funny and uh, are well delivered yeah. and uh, are delivered with a great sense of irony <laughs> right? yeah. and they're hilarious. Thank you. But if you, if you take them and you take away the context yeah. and you write them down, then they are, can be punching yeah. down. Like you, you had a great routine about uh, homeless people and the beer tenants. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you're right. That, I mean, I, was, I don't know if I would... That was 15, maybe even yes. longer years ago, and I don't know whether I would do that again now, yeah. although I might get away with it. I don't know. I had more then. The exaggerated sort of um, baffled upper-class toff kind mm. of persona that I played then, I mean, literally sort of in tweed, you know, mm. whatever, made that more obviously funny because yes. it was mm. quite clear that this man had no idea what that was going on in the real world. It mm. was, you know, uh, it's interesting, isn't it? That uh, homeless chap over there who's vomiting up his breakfast appears to be wearing the same socks as I am. You know, is that kind yeah, of, you yeah, know, yeah. picking on some mindless triviality instead mm. of... The, you have to do that. If if I were, and as time has gone on, I think I'm less of an exaggerated persona now. I mm. think I'm moving more towards who I really am because as you get older, you do just kind of, I don't know, I, 
uh, it's partly because it's exhausting to write in character all the time, but also you have things you actually want to say. Yeah, maybe that's self-indulgent. But as a result, I think some of that earlier material might sound more cruel now because mm. it would seem to be me saying it rather than... But then again, Stuart Lee has that defense as well. He says, even though he's never played a character, he says that Stuart Lee on stage is nothing like Stuart Lee really, you know. Yeah. And Stuart Lee, Lee says, he, for instance, has this kind of unbridled hostility towards the ignorant half of his audience, you know. Most of you don't even get that, do you? You know, that kind of thing. Well, that is funny and it works because he is sort of, you know, an exaggerated version of himself. But it is still himself and I am still myself. But the more you push the exaggeration, the more you can then get away with the fact that, of course, he doesn't mean that. Of course, yeah. he's well aware that homelessness is a serious issue. Yeah. You know, he's just presenting the idea that somebody could be distracted by this absurd, you know, etymological <laughs> coincidence. But do you not think, Simon, we've reached this point now? I mean, I, I, and the, the question that Constantine posed was incredibly valid. Of course it was. But jokes aren't meant to be taken literally. No, but they do have subtext. And if they didn't have subtext at all, they wouldn't be as powerful as they are. I, th I don't think it's a bad thing that we have conversation. I do think people should laugh and their default mm. should be to laugh mm. and take you in good faith. And only after a certain period of time should you start to think, I'm not sure this comedian is in good faith. I think he genuinely does want to stir up racial division or disharmony yeah. or whatever. But... Well, you've seen but, Francis. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I've seen him heckling. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I do think I do think it's it's a good thing that jokes have the ability to like they have a bit of steel in them. I don't mm. think that's a bad thing. You know, I think that's that's part of what makes the comedy scene very, you know, fertile um, ground for discussion like this. You know, if it was just jokes, there would be nothing to talk about, would mm. it? I, I think that's fine. I think that's okay. It's just you know overreaction or whatever or. Early in my life, I played the comedy store and there was a woman in the front row. I did an old joke, which I'd done dozens of times, where I said um, my granddad, it, it was based on actually, but I used to refer to him as my neighbor, Stan. Uh, but yes. He was my granddad's father. But my neighbor, Stan, this was a true story about him. He used to refer to the next door neighbors as the darkies next door. And I said, which was a bit offensive and certainly rather old-fashioned, especially considering they're Cornish. <laughs> now, in fact, they were Portuguese, which I still felt was a bit, you know, just amused me that he called them the darkies, you know, <laughs> even the, the faintest sort of yeah. deviation yeah. from Anglo-Saxon yeah. skin yeah. tones. Yeah. But he was, a, he was a kind, gentle old man, you know, who was just uh, expressing his, the views of his generation. Anyway, this woman on the front row, as soon as I uh, said that, she said, sharp intake of breath, audible intake of breath. I said, what was the matter? And she went, I don't like no, we don't like darky jokes. She just heard the word darky mm. and assumed this was a joke about darkies, yeah. you know, yeah. and about them being a problem or being stupid or something, mm. you know. Not at the expense of an old man whose racist views were not only racist, they were incoherent and mm. had no, you mm. know, uh, no sort of genetic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that, I went into it and took the piss out of her and the audience came back. But there was a sort of balance, you know, there was a moment, but like... I felt I had to deal with that because if I'd just gone, yeah, you're right, sorry, I shouldn't do that. Oh, no. You know, then yeah. you've lost your oh, confidence, you've lost your faith, you know, the whole, the, from out of that would have rippled an entire. So instead, she had to be, you know, dealt with cruelly. <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly what I was going to ask you. Final question before yeah. we ask the very final question is uh, one of your uh, probably most known jokes would be jokes about the joke about your eyes. Yes. Right. Which I understand you got from a heckler. Yes. At the uh, up the creek. Mm. Sunday night at up the creek where it used to be uh, Malcolm Hardy's most sort of legendary performances. He would you'd have a decent act in the first half and a decent act in the final section, but in the middle section was uh, was all open spots and he'd always go, oh, the next one might be good, might be shit. You know, there was no there was no attempt to big you up at all. Yeah. And there were a group of guys, I think they were all cab drivers and they all used to congregate around the sound booth in the back left hand court, uh, section of the, of the room who were just absolute samurai I mean they were or ninjas I should say they were devastating hecklers and they, they made or broke a number of careers you know and if you went on there without the confidence that you had what it took you know that could be the end of your career you know they would dismantle you and that was it, but that was the only one. He shouted out, where are your eyes? <laughs> and the whole, and I had no idea. My eyes do disappear in shadow on, <laughs> under stage lighting. Yeah. In normal conditions, they're small, but you can see where they are. But under stage lights, you know, <laughs> the angle comes down. They just look like, yeah, like uh, holes, like I've been, you know, gouged. Mm. And everyone laughed. And I had no idea why. And I couldn't get it back from there. I, I'd done about two or three minutes. It was going all right, you know, not brilliantly. And then that was it. And then I just sort of shuffled off. <laughs> and then afterwards, I was talking to somebody and they said, yeah, no, your eyes do disappear. Maybe and I, we, we agreed that I should do that joke. Mm. I should yeah. get in there mm. first because then you have a level of self-awareness that audiences love. Audiences mm. love it. That's the, oh, the old so-and-so has let himself go. That's mm. the usual joke, right? Yeah. 
egg out of this life, you look a bit like. Have you ever heard that? No, no. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for that joke. Yeah. Tell me, Simon. Go for it. Egg was a character in uh, This Life, which was an early version of sort of uh, steady cam, single camera sort of... Um, uh, it was a lovely sort of comedy drama series about people starting out their, their postgraduate lives in London. Uh -huh. And uh, Egg was a, very much a serious it's a sort of bit of a heartthrob, in fact. Oh, so okay. You, well, I'm going to have to do the research on how offensive of the that audience, is. Yeah, yeah. Look him up. But that kind of thing, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Of course, you, you haven't let yourself go. That's yeah. the problem. You're younger than him. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Lincoln. But there's all that thing. Right. Stuart Lee, again, who appears I'm obsessed with, you, he had a 10-minute routine in which he did all the people mm. that he looked like and let themselves go from Terry Christian through... Um, the bloke who used to be in Grange Hill and then Tucker, who then yeah. ended up in EastEnders, all these people he looks at, and all of them worked, and the audience would laugh again and again and again, and you just realize he looks like so many people, it's absurd. He has an even better one now. I saw him a couple of weeks ago at the Bill Murray in yeah. London, uh, and he walked on stage and went, uh, it looks like uh, Julian Assange has let himself go, and he looks exactly like a fat version of Julian Assange. See, now. That's interesting. But he kind of hasn't got the white hair, presumably. And he's got the white hair and, and the beard. He's got the whole look. I, I reckon he's probably God. cultivated it just for that wow, one joke. Yeah. That is amazing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so, but the reason I bring up the But ice anyway, thing, I wanted yeah. to tell you just to end yeah. that. Must have been at least 10 years later. I was in a cab, mm. and as I went to pay, the bloke goes, You're a comedian, aren't you? And I went, Yeah. He goes, oh, I saw you years ago. I don't know if you remember me. I heckled you. <laughs> from uh, the back of the up the creek I shouted uh, where are your eyes and yeah. uh, and he was the one who'd done that and I I mean that was the opening routine I used on my, Michael McIntyre's Roadshow mm. that was like my my first properly televised you know yeah. I had to give him a fairly healthy tip <laughs> yeah. huge laugh of course yeah. I was good. but the reason I bring it up is that do you think comedy is possible without an element of cruelty even at your own expense. Even at, Because this is one of the things that when I turned down that contract from SOAS, a lot of people were saying, well, why do you need to be cruel? And I was kind of saying, well, look, even self-deprecating comedy yes. is cruel. Yes. Often the cruelest comedy yes. is self-deprecating comedy. Do you think it's possible to, 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 for comedy to, to be this place where everyone's just holding hands and, you know? No, I, if, if you define cruelty that way, I think you're right. There has to be some sort of target, even if it is only the bigotry of those who had previously defined something else as the target. You know, something has to get it, mm. yeah. Even Ch Charlie Chaplin, who, you know, lovable uh, tramp, you know, um, encountering modern technology and, and having sorts of... I mean, there's still the cruelty there that this is a, essentially one of life's most marginalised and vulnerable people <laughs> who has been... Who, who can't even manage to get across the road, you know, without... And, and, but is then using his... His, his native abilities to do so despite his low socioeconomic status. If he was not low socioeconomic status, it wouldn't be so funny. And so there's a kind of cruelty of, of like, uh, it's not a million miles from the tenor's joke in a way. It's kind of going, oh, well, it's all right, isn't it? Because, you know, they have this kind of acrobatic ability, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think you do have to have it. But it can be dressed up in all kinds of different ways. And that's what I think a really good comedy show is, is one where the target moves around so much that even though at some level you're, you're registering that, you know, that there's some cruelty it's not relentlessly in pursuit of a single objective. Although that, again, can be funny if you overdo it so obviously. Mm. Again, with my Welsh routine, I would do it. It would become a bit too long. I was nagging on a nerve. Then I would go, anyway, time to move on. Although I will say this, you know, <laughs> and, then, and then you kind of get, you know, and then it's yeah. funny again. But yeah, you have to move it around. And, and that's where self-deprecating uh, comedy is an essential part of any remotely long set because it's sometimes you have to switch it around and it comes back at you. And this is why it becomes, as I said, a boxing match rather than boxing like, a, you know, punching up or punching down is still just punching. You have to take the punches as well. And, uh, you know, Rocky was right on that front. You know, essentially, at the end of the day, life is about how many punches you can take rather than how many, you know, it's how many times you can get up rather than how many times you can knock someone else down. That, I think, is um, probably, you know, as, as as profound a lesson as you can learn through the course of your life that that's what it takes, you know. And that's often quite literally what the best boxers have, it, it turns out as well. Powerfully built skulls that mm. can take pounding, rather mm. rather than um, it all being in the in the biceps and the hips, and that is a that is a massive part of being a decent comedian. Any comedian who looks remotely thin skinned themselves, that is that is the death. That is the end. If you, you if you yourself are thin skinned about comedy, and there are one or two people who. Uh, sort of uh, pop up frequently on various, uh, you know, television opportunities to discuss comedy matters who are, who to my mind do demonstrate, you know, who speak for the industry, but are themselves 
thin-skinned in my view. I'm not going to name names, but I'm sure. Some oh, I know who you're talking about. about. So uh, someone who might have called me a Nazi a while back. Yeah. Yes, yeah. 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 yes, exactly. Well, that is just the death of comedy for me. Once you've reached that point, you know, it's all over. Well, uh, on that, I, I'm, I'm really happy. I am really happy with how this episode has <laughs> is, is, is come to a it's close. Ended up back as a, it, it's, yeah. I've been validated <laughs> and defended by by a comedy yeah, hero. I want to I, I know that you've made him absolutely intolerable, <laughs> <laughs> and I am going to bear the brunt of this for the next six months. So yeah. thank you, Simon. But uh, the last question we always ask our guests, yes. which is, uh, what's the one thing people are talking about, uh, aren't talking about that we really do need to be talking about? Right, in, in comedy or? No, no, no whatever, ever, whatever you want. Anything. Well, funnily enough, I had a conversation with a friend this morning. I stayed over with a friend in, in London, and, um, and this was the chat we had in, uh, over coffee, is that we are all living longer, and nobody is paying very much attention to what to do with the final third of your life. My father is 89 years old now, and he sort of retired. He took sort of necessary retirement, essentially mid-50s. So he has spent over 30 years of his life in his post-work environment, and yet there's almost no discussion about how to make... He personally is a very resourceful individual who bought a wood-turning lathe. He has a kiln he's used until quite recently, has all sorts of hobbies and crafts, and he keeps himself active and has not just slumped in front of the television for that time at all. But, you know, that is a serious issue. And I'm 54 now. That's the age at which he lost his, his job and, and was deemed, you know, unemployable again. Essentially, you know, a man of that age with no qualifications, very hard to, to find work in the, in the midst of a recession as it was then. So that's an issue which I sort of think about now. You know, what, how do you make sense of the final third of life? We are all, we have available to us all the medications that will keep us alive. They'll keep us ticking over. You know, you see anyone in their 80s has a pill box, you know, with all the dates and the times and the, you mm. know, without which they would probably be dead, but they're not dead. They need, they need to be, we need to find ways to occupy them. And ideally, even to make them economically productive. You know, I know that sounds harsh, but if you've got, a, you know, half your population are, are post economic productivity, that is not something that any nation can survive for very long. So I think that is the big issue. And it was interesting that Theresa May raised that issue prior to the 2017 general election. And it turned out to be so toxic, such a third rail, that I think that's what lost to the, essentially lost to the election. She didn't emerge from that with the pro, anything like uh, a workable majority. Mm. I think she lost the, um, she lost the goodwill of that, you know, those mm. elderly Tory voters who are always reliable, will always come out, wind or shine, um, mm. to, uh, to, 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 to vote Tory because they, they feel that the Tories will look after. But any suggestion that we might need to look at the financial arrangements or the way in which we approach, you know, in which a nation deals with its elderly um, is extraordinarily uh, toxic debate. It's a very taboo subject now, even among those people themselves, talking among themselves. They don't like to discuss it, but, they, but we need to address that because everyone is living much, much longer than they used to be. And our welfare state, you know, people talk endlessly about whether migrants or immigrants are a burden on it or whether they, in fact, of course, which it, the, the statistics suggest, produce the tax receipts which allow us to pay for it. You know, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very wrong-headed view. There are dozens, I'm, I don't want to close down any conversation about immigration, but there are dozens of ways to talk about it. But in terms of them being a burden on it, I just think that's been disproved categorically. But what is a burden on it is, you know, an elderly population who's whose own um, mental health, you know, is at risk from their, from their inability to engage or, or be productive or be useful. And we need more templates for how they, can be, how they can be engaged usefully and constructively in society. Basically, I'm saying grandmothers should look after my kids. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, I've missed that opportunity. But uh, yeah, that, that, that is the, the big conversation no one wants to have. And it's a, it's a very important one. So, Simon, if someone wants to find you on Twitter, on Instagram... I can't imagine after that. that they <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absurdly yeah. serious, but yeah. it is a burning issue. I'm the Simon Evans on Twitter. Yeah. I visit Instagram about once a year and very rarely post yeah. anything of use. But uh, Twitter is my place, yeah. yeah. I have a Facebook page, but it's not for, it's not for the fans. And you are going to be at the Edinburgh Festival. Yes. Uh, tell us where the show is. Tell everybody uh, what the show is called and uh, where it is. I'm going to be at the Assembly Rooms on George Square, which is um, sort of down towards the Meadows. And uh, I think it's Assembly Room. I think it's Studio 2, but I'm not sure anyway. The show is called Dressing for Dinner, but that's just one of those names. Don't <laughs> worry about that too much. Simon Evans, 8 p.m. Uh, give or take five minutes at the George Square 
assembly room. Simon, as you will have seen during this interview, is an absolutely fantastic comedian. Make sure you go and see him if you're in Edinburgh for the festival. I'll be there as well, as you know, uh, doing all well that ends well. Francis is going to be performing here in London at the Bill Murray a couple of times during August. Because I fucking hate Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> as always, follow us at TriggerPod on all the social media. Don't want to drag this out too long. We will see you in a week from now. Absolutely. And also as well, please leave us a nice iTunes review. Uh, tell a friend about it if you enjoy it. Subscribe also now on BitChute if you want to check us out there. But uh, thank you very much and we'll see you next week. Bye bye. Bye bye. Now here's the form that you were asked to. <laughs> it said, by signing this contract, this is the UNICEF on campus at SOAS, right? He was asked to sign an agreement that his routine would not contain racism, sexism, classism, ageism, ableism, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, xenophobia, Islamophobia, anti-religion, anti-atheism. I think you're doing some quite complicated mental arithmetic to offset the fact that people didn't think you were funny. Uh, I think the reality well, is... Well, 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 the, the, the way you, these students no, okay, saw me performing a top secret comedy club. You have absolutely no sense of humour, do you? I feel like you're just... I mean, you're just sort of being a bit of an alt-right. You know, oh, all oh, right. Well, that, that, we got there in the end. You did. You did. You did. Well, that, that, I, I, Very I, good. I, I, the good thing about being called an Nazi comedian, right, is I now have got a niche. <laughs> Problem is, I haven't got any racist, sexist, homophobic jokes. I don't do I've been a student at the university. Well, you can't make any joke about anything. In case these poor little woke students get upset or triggered. Get over yourselves. It's not about comedy, it's about ordinary people up and down the country and here in Britain yes. and in America feeling like they can't say what they think. I really don't, like, I get it. I get it, especially, especially the women who want to become men. I get it. <laughs> Do you remember when Gareth Bale, right, went from Tottenham to Real Madrid? The guy left a perfectly good club for more money. <laughs> Everybody feels like we're we're all kind of under arrest. We're all all everything we say can and will be used against us in the court of public opinion, and they're coming for the comedians first because we're we're the ones that, as you say, are allowed to transgress. But everybody else feels it, and that's why the story's got the resonance that it has.